Hello everyone and welcome back to my KSP tutorial series in Crawl Space Program 1.1.2 now. Uh, KSP has been updated with a few patches and so hopefully if there were any bugs that we would have hit we will not hit them now but probably there is still some work to do. Uh, this time we are going to talk about interplanetary transfers and that's why I am in the tracking station because we're going to aim for Duna here. And I'll just remind you of the angles that we want for each of the planets. So when you are in the tracking station to time warp to the right position in order to make your transfer to the other planets, you want Kerbin to be over here. Imagine uh, if you've taken algebra, you know, y-axis, x-axis. So uh, put uh, Kerbin on the x-axis uh, aligned with the sun or just, you know, a horizontal line like this. And, you know, this is 90 degrees, 180 degrees, 270 degrees is down here, and so forth. And here we see that Duna is currently at about 110 degrees or something like that. Maybe Eve here is currently at about uh, 40 degrees, something like that. And we just want to uh, hit them roughly. So what you would aim for is for Moho to be around, let's say, 110 degrees. Eve would be behind us by 54 degrees. Uh, Duna, what you would want is it ahead of us by 45 degrees. Drez, you would want it ahead of us by about 82 degrees. For Jewel, you would want it ahead of us by 96 degrees. And you can look these up. I mean, uh, these are all online. These are only rough approximations, though, which is why I'm not, uh, I'm not making them firm or anything like that. I'm not uh, displaying them on the side because it will depend on the exact... Uh, situation so these numbers are based on them being circular orbits and uh, the planets aren't always in the circular orbit uh, for Elu I think it's about 106 degrees ahead of us the only one that uh, you transfer to when it's behind Kerbin is Eve so that that's behind us by 54 degrees okay so um, there is a calculation to figure that out it's not a complicated calculation you can look it up uh, a phase angle approximation for transfers to other planets but I'm not going to go through it here. This time I'm just going to time warp and wait until Duna is ahead of us by 54 degrees. Oh sorry, 45 degrees. Now it's interesting to note that the transfer for between Earth and Mars is the same as that for Kerbin and Duna. So for Earth and Mars also you'll want Mars 45 degrees ahead roughly speaking um, and again, it, uh, it varies depending on the exact situation because Mars is also not in a perfectly circular orbit around the Sun and there is also inclination to worry about. So here is about 45 degrees and also actually the transfer between Earth and Jupiter is about the same as that between uh, Kerbin and Joule. So that's sort of handy. So you're getting some decent practice if you ever wanted to send probes out in real life <laughs> or in real solar system anyway. So, going back to VAB now, let's discuss what kind of a probe we will send. I am going to send a probe, so uh, let's use our Minmus probe as a basis. How much more do we need to land something on Duna, is the question. Do we need a heat shield? Well, uh, we do want to take advantage of Duna's atmosphere in order to slow down, so maybe a heat shield a heat shield would be advisable. In that case, what I can do is I can put the antenna in a different location. Uh, let's not block the solar panels. Let's just put it on top of the can here. And then we can put the heat shield right on top. So uh, we've got the lander legs and stuff there, so we'll have to actually flip around in order to use this engine. Normally what you would want is radial engines and a heat shield or something like that, but we don't have small radial engines. So we'll just put the heat shield on top and try and flip around. In order to facilitate flipping around at the right time, we will put parachutes. And when the parachutes open, they'll uh, flip the vehicle around in the appropriate way. So what you want is, if the parachutes are above the center mass, they're going to pop out over here and so this side will be pointing down. If I put the parachutes on this side, then they're on the opposite side of the center mass, and then this side will be pointing down when they open. So that's the thing you need to consider. So aerobraking is just using the atmosphere to slow down. That's what the term means. 
And it's handy so you don't have to use your engine to slow down, so you can save on fuel. And Delta V. Not all planets have atmospheres, so obviously it is not always the case that you can aerobrake. Okay, now it's sort of blended in there. Now if we had small decouplers, I would uh, dump the... Well, I think we can actually heat shield jettison, so that's, that's fine. We don't need the decoupler in order to jettison the heat shield. That is handy. So we will do that after the parachutes deploy. So the parachutes don't have to carry the heat shield as well. We probably don't need all of, of the all of the ablator. So let's dump some of that. Now, as far as how it goes with Duna compared to Minmus, it doesn't cost that much more. But for margin's sake, I am going to put two boosters. We're just going to overdo it a little bit, and we'll see how much margin we end up with when we put two boosters on. Now, we've got a little bit of a problem here, right? Because this is not the kind of surface you want to have hitting the atmosphere. It's not very smooth. So, we will have a decoupling nose cone. And we'll get rid of that once we get close to orbit. It's sort of like a fairing, but since we don't have fairings, this is the best we can do. So I'm going to throw this one down a bit. How, how, how much do we weigh? We weigh very little. And that'll allow this one to last longer than the two boosters do. Alright, so that is a possible probe for Duna. I don't know if this will work perfectly. Let's find out. Alright, well there it is. SAS on, throttle up. Our resources and launch. So we just go to orbit normally first for an interplanetary transfer. You don't have to worry about anything as far as that goes. Just get to orbit and then we'll do the transfer work from there. Okay, set. Alright, the boosters are off. And they, they nearly crashed into each other there, but no problems. So we're not bringing this probe back. We're going to land this on Duna, transmit the information. As far as coming back from Duna, we will do that with a Kerbal. So you'll see how that works when we uh, land a Kerbal there. Oh shucks, I think I put this around the wrong way. Hmm. Yep. I think this decoupler, I should have reversed it. On reflection. Let me get that on. Yeah, see, now it's stuck on there. So, you will want to make sure that that is reversed on your own attempt. Alright, uh, I'm going to throttle down, separate the stage. And let's just uh, coast up to Apoapsis a bit. Now, we are carrying the mass of the parachutes as well. And we're carrying a lot of parachutes, so... Gotta keep that in mind. Okay, we have a periapsis and we're in orbit. Let's just keep it uh, close to Kerbin. That's alright, that's not gonna cause us any problems. And in fact, that's beneficial. And then we can set Duna as a target now. Now, assuming that our timing is correct and that we're at the right phase angle, what we would do is start burning around here uh, between 4 and 5 o'clock. If we were going to Eve or Moho, which are on the inner, you know, inside of Kerbin's orbit, you would go at about 10 to 11 o'clock over here. Again, setting the current trajectory of Kerbin, you know, the way Kerbin is going at 12 o'clock, you would, uh, if for the outer planets, you would go between 4 and 5, just about, and for the inner planets, you will go between 10 and 11. So I'm going to create a maneuver node here. And if you can't create maneuver nodes, you can try and hit it just by uh, starting your burn there and making sure that your outward trajectory lines up with Kerbin's trajectory. So this, is, this purple line is our outbound trajectory and you can see it's very closely in line with Kerbin's own trajectory, which means that we are going to make use of Kerbin's momentum. This is exactly the same as you would do for uh, outbound trajectory from Earth to one of the other planets. And then if you wanted to hit Venus or something, you would again burn out at around 10 to 11 o'clock. So this is, this is good. This is probably more than we need though. 
yeah, you can see we're actually going beyond Duna right now, so we don't need to do that. We can pull it in. That's a little bit too tight. And I want to fine tune it so that we're back in line. Now, that doesn't give us much time to actually do this burn. So if you want it, if uh, you missed the burn time, you can press plus here. You right click on the maneuver no node and press plus, and then that'll be the next orbit. So this time I'm uh, aiming for the next orbit. Now I have 32 minutes to do it instead of less than a minute. So I'm not rushed. But that does change things, obviously. It's subtly different. Okay, now back in line. Not quite hitting it. So, our timing was not right. If our timing was perfect, then we would actually have an uh, encounter there. Oh, well, encounter probably around here. It would be on the opposite side of the sun from Kerbin. But our timing is not right unless there's an encounter that's intending to happen somewhere else. So, we need to uh, tweak the position of this to try and get it closer. So I can move it like that. Does that make it closer? Well, we need to boost out a little bit. We get the number. It looks like uh, 2 million kilometers. Let's go a little further. And then you'll notice that uh, any time I sort of move that, I have to add a little bit more. We are getting closer. It's 1.66 million kilometers now. But I'm... It's costing me a little bit more because it's not the ideal transfer point, as it turns out. I was only roughly estimating the 45 degrees. It wasn't like I had the exact angle. So this is probably somewhat the wrong timing. And it just goes to show that uh, even if you don't have the timing perfect, you can still manage it. It just costs just a little bit more. So don't fret about that. Uh, if you find that your orbit is going like this way, then you're, that's probably probably not good. Maybe you'll be better off waiting than actually forcing it. But here I think, you know, it's going to cost me maybe 50 meters per second more, and I would rather just get it done. Now you'll notice something about the encounter that's happening over there. Uh, you'll notice that the encounter is happening happening right near the descending node. That Now that's convenient, because it means we don't have to adjust our inclination at all. It is possible that if you were trying to hit one of the other planets, actually Jewel is not in a bad position. Let me let me boost further and try and hit Jewel here instead of Duna. Now I told you that for Jewel we wanted 96 degrees ahead, which would be about here. So this is a little bit late to burn for Jewel. Jewel is we've already gone a little bit ahead, and Jewel is now not quite 90 degrees ahead of us. But you can see the descending node here is not touching the orbit and we have a 1.3 degree discrepancy between us and Joule. 1.3 degree difference now. Okay, I guess Joule was not the best example because Joule is so huge, it's like Jupiter, that uh, it'll suck us in anyway. But this isn't the ideal approach to Joule. You can click on it and focus view and what you will see is uh, we are not really... You see there's Joule and Joule's moons and our pass is coming in like this, which is really, really low. That's because of our inclination. So what we would do then is add a maneuver node at the descending node. And our initial burn, we were doing prograde retrograde, right? We were just pulling the yellowish green handles and nothing else. This time at the inclination change, we are only going to... well will mainly be interested in the purple ones. And so we see that our orbit is coming in below Jewel, right? So we're going to take the upper one and pull it up. And you can see now we're getting it higher and this is about right. So this is the main thing that we're doing here. Sometimes you won't even have an encounter and sometimes Kerbal Space Program does not want to show you your encounter. As you can see, we actually have a little encounter there, but sometimes it blinks out. Um, sometimes you'll have to manipulate the inclination change before you even get an encounter, so you'll have to watch out for that. 
So sometimes you'll have to create that maneuver node just to get an encounter, especially with Moho or Elu. You might not have an encounter without doing a mid-course adjustment or uh, getting that in. It's nice that Kerbal allows you to make more than one maneuver at a time. So we can make a sequence of maneuvers and figure things out like that. Now, we're still pretty far away from Jewel, so we would like to bring that in. And instead of doing that at the mid-course plane change, which is an inclination change mainly, we'll, we'll mainly do that... Ooh, we will, if, uh, if you scroll on the, on the maneuver node, it adjusts things. We'll do that actually at our original burn. So you can see I'm actually scrolling down very delicately on the prograde vector and that reduces how much speed we're going in with and that's starting to bring our orbit really close to Joule and we actually would want to go on this side of Joule. Here we see that we are coming close to where the moons of Joule are so that's ideal. But this episode was not about going to Joule. Uh, and just demonstrating some of the more complicated things that need to happen if you're hitting a planet that has an inclination and mainly that's a mid-course adjustment like this. You'll note that if you do things right, the mid-course adjustment uh, takes a trivial amount compared to the initial burn. It's like a tenth of the initial burn is fair. Okay, it could be more than that depending on the inclination, but in Kerbal Space Program normally the inclination is not so bad that, well, actually the closer to the sun you are, the worse it is. So uh, making an inclination change to hit Eve or Moho is much harder and costs a lot more than the inclination change to the outer planets. The outer planets it's not going to cost so much because it costs more the closer you are to the sun. Okay, So if you, at all possible, make your inclination change as far away from the sun as you can. Alright, but like I said, we are not trying to hit Joule, though this is apparently an okay time to do that. We are actually trying to hit... Duna. So again, backspace to refocus on your your actual vessel. Okay, but this time it so happens we're hitting at the descending node and also we don't have much of an inclination anyway, so it's going to be really convenient. If you can, you do want to hit the target planet at one of the nodes. Then that'll save you from having to do the inclination change. Okay, now we have a Duna encounter. It's not a particularly good Duna encounter. If we focus view on Duna, we see coming in low and a little bit far away. I'm trying to use the scroll wheel to fine tune this, but you can see it's not really doing a great job of it. So, adjusting it from as far away as we are is too touchy right because we need finer control over the maneuver so I'm still going to make a mid-course correction here closer to the target well it's not easier it costs more Delta V to make an adjustment closer to the target but it's easier to make the finer adjustments because it costs more Delta V now this is something that will happen a lot when you try to go to Duna you will get an Ike encounter. Ike is the moon of Duna and it it likes to grab passing probes into its sphere of influence. It's very easy to hit Ike. If you want to visit Ike it's not hard. But I want to go straight for Duna here. And so again I'm using the scroll wheel to fine tune this being very patient. And there we are. We are in Duna's atmosphere 12.8 kilometers is well within Duna's atmosphere. Duna's atmosphere extends to I think 45, no 50, 50 kilometers there. You can click on here and see the atmospheric height and the atmospheric pressure and all the other details whether an atmosphere is present. Remember you can't error break without an atmosphere being present. If there's no atmosphere present at your target you will need to use your engine to slow down and make orbit. Now if we were going to use our engine to slow down and make orbit we could, ah, it doesn't like that. Okay, uh, every now and again Ker Kerbal does not like you messing with stuff. And so we'll just do, it's because I'm trying to make a third maneuver node now, which is excessive. So we'll just do a few maneuvers first and then Kerbal will like it better. Now, interplanetary burns can be fairly long. Could take a long time. 
I wouldn't like to start my burn any more than 20 degrees away from the prograde vector. That would be very inefficient. I don't think this stage is going to take that long to do this burn. I think that should be alright. Let's start. Our staging doesn't appear to be perfect here. That's... okay, that one is next. And then that engine. Trying to do this as closely as possible. But expect to have to adjust things along the way. Okay, well, within 0.2 meters per second. So now we're going to go out and we're going to do that maneuver. Uh, but that does not look like it gets us our encounter, so that's wrong. So we don't have a encounter right now. Let's see if we can do some burns. Let's try a retrograde here. So I'm pointing at the retrograde vector. Let's see how, what that does to our closest approach distance. Seems like it brings our closest approach distance down, so that's good, and we'll continue adjusting like that. I don't have to plot anything, I just want to take a look at that number, and I'll wait until it stops going down. Now I could, if I wanted to, point at some of the other vectors to see what they do. Okay, so that seems to be, oops, actually it decided to change that on me. That seems to be close to the best we can do. 71.8, well, 71,800 kilometers. So now we will plot a maneuver here to get it in closer. And this time I will, well, I will start with the that vector. But actually it seems like a prograde or retrograde is the main thing. So there we have a Duna encounter. I mean, we could make it crash into Duna, but that's not very good. All right, we'll take that. So now we are heading away from Kerbin for the first time. We will want to make sure that we pay attention to the electric charge. Our solar panels don't extend and don't track the sun. And for instance, right now, our engine is pointed at the sun and our solar panels don't seem to be doing the greatest job they could. So let's uh, go sideways so that at least one of our solar panels is catching the sun, right? and then time warp. And along the way our situation with respect to the sun will change so we have to watch out for that. Something I always forget and I lose electric charge. It happens. So this kind of transfer that I'm doing is called a Hohmann transfer and it is the most efficient transfer given certain criteria if the orbits are circular and if the inclination is all in line, then it's the most efficient transfer. There are more efficient options if those are not the case. Um, there are also possibilities if you have n-body physics, but we don't have n-body physics in Kerbal Space Program. What we have is called patched conics, which is a situation where the gravity of one body is calculated each time. So. We are now no longer influenced by Kerbin at all. We are only influenced by the Sun. And then once we reach Duna SOI, we will only be influenced by Duna and not the Sun at all. Oops, we passed the maneuver node. It is all right for the in, for the mid-course adjustments. The accuracy of where you hit that node is not too much of a problem because we're talking about uh, hundreds of days trip. And if you're a few hours off, it's not going to be too much of a margin of difference. Just keep an eye on what's actually happening. So I'm actually going to get rid of that node and see what the periapsis is. Yeah, that'll be good enough. Within a thousand kilometers. It's not within Duna's atmosphere, but I'll take it for now. It'll allow me to demonstrate what you should do once you get into the SOI of Duna or any other planet to get your approach closer to that planet. So let's continue. Oh well, let's check that our solar panel is well lit. You'll notice the question marks, those are asteroids. We will get into asteroid capture missions and what to do there. But yeah, those are the asteroids. You'll be able to track them in the tracking station and then they will get a, a name of sorts. Alright, we are now entering the sphere influence of Duna. 
There we go. So now, as soon as you enter the sphere of influence of Duna, it is the best time to fix your inclination and get your orbit close to the planet. And again, if you wanted to flatten your orbit, you notice our orbit is a bit high. Now, if you wanted to go into a polar orbit, that's fine. But let's say I wanted to flatten the orbit. Well, the triangle, the normal vector, is to, in uh, to go north if you will, but we're too far north, so I want the anti-normal vector, which is this one. But instead of just doing this, I also want to bring us closer into Duna. So let's try and find the correct vector for that, which is the radial in vector, which is this one. And I can do both things at the same time by burning in between those two. See, now my orbit is getting closer and flattening out. So we'll get a nice equatorial approach. Now that, that's pretty flat, so I'll just focus on the normal in vector. I want to avoid too much heat, but Aduna's atmosphere is fairly thin, right? I mean, if we take a look at, uh, oh, we can need to zoom in on Duna here. If we take a look at the information, it's 1 16th the thickness of Kerbin's atmosphere. So that's pretty thin. I don't anticipate too much trouble, but we'll see. This stage is done. I mean, and it has very little fuel left, but basically it's done its job. Um, my expectation is just going to crash into the surface of Duna, hopefully. Maybe, we'll ma maybe we should make sure of that. Instead of having our orbit this far up, we should have a crash course for that stage to dispose of it so it doesn't remain hanging around in the system. Okay, now we're on a crash course. We will separate that. That's spent stage, so we don't have junk in orbit. Uh-oh. Here, one thing I can do is right-click and decouple. Okay, now that's going to work. Okay, so that's on a crash course, but we don't want to be. So we will use this engine. I'm going to activate this engine manually and boost away again. Now of course uh, if we're too low it doesn't really matter because we're going to be wanting to land anyway but sometimes you want to capture in an orbit instead of actually landing directly maybe you want to land in a particular location if you want to land in a special location you don't want to go straight down to the surface you want to actually um, just capture into orbit first and then wait a little bit and make sure you land correctly right so we'll see whether we're at 20 kilometers now we'll see what that does when we error break at 20 kilometers now if we didn't error break we would want to be above the 50 kilometer limit of the atmosphere and then we would have to plan to use about 600 700 meters per second of delta V to get into orbit but if we error break we don't have to do that at all we can just use the atmosphere of Duna to get into orbit and that will save us a lot of delta V so we're trying to do that right now. It's possible that the LB-909 engine could have heat shielded us and that we don't need the heat shield at all. That's something else we could test sometime. With a probe that would make sense to test but let's just uh, see what happens with the heat shield and that weird decoupler that I accidentally put on the wrong way. Now normally when hitting the atmosphere you want to orient retrograde but that would mean that our engine is pointing at the airflow and all the heat and all. This time our heat shield is on the front so we will actually want to point prograde. Now people are gonna complain my god you're missing so much science so let me do some science. <laughs> yeah I, I know I missed the science in uh, orbit around the Sun. Okay I'm going to transmit this one so we get some science out of it. Yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm not uh, making sure that I get all the science, folks, if you haven't noticed already. Uh, I'm going to leave you to figure out where to do the science. I know that might irritate some people, but, you know, this is part of the exploration part of things. You figure out where to do the science. Anyway, temperature scan. I'm not going to hit every biome for you. You're going to have to find those on your own. Okay. Let's proceed. Now obviously for the sake of electric charge you do want to land on the lit side of the planet or the moon wherever you're happen happening to target. 
The only moon that has an atmosphere is the moon of Jewel known as Leith. All the others lack an atmosphere, so you're going to have to plan to use engine power in order to get into orbit around them or to land. Okay, here we go. We are now approaching the atmosphere. We're at 60 kilometers. Let's orient prograde as I intended. That engine nozzle is going crazy. We should be getting solar input. Um, I think that engine nozzle going crazy is actually taking a lot of... Yeah, it was taking a lot of electric charge. Hmm. Oh, we're spin stabilized. Accidentally. Okay. I guess that'll be fine. Let's see what happens. So our periapsis was 20 kilometers. Pretty much exactly. So for future reference. Okay, I'll, I'll use SAS to stabilize. I really don't need this to keep going like it. I'm a little bit worried about it going like out of control or something. Okay, we are slowing down. We want the surface speed in particular. And we'll see when we make orbit. If we make orbit. It's not slowing us down that much so far. Gotta observe a mystery goo here. Uh, I don't know if it's safe to transmit. Is it, is it safe to transmit? Let's find out. Let's see if it's safe to transmit the data right here. Yep. Now, because of the drag, we're actually going lower than 20 kilometers, so... You have to keep that in mind that the drag will pull you in lower than the altitude you were at initially, but now we're going up. So it's about 500 meters that pull us in. Are we going to make orbit here? Okay, we have made orbit. And it is being brought down. I genuinely had no idea whether this was the right altitude, so if it turns out good, I'll be pleasantly surprised. And good, again, is actually a stable orbit around Duna this time. All we have to do is go back to apoapsis and come down at the same periapsis and we'll definitely land. If we make a nice tight orbit around Duna. Seems like even the decoupler didn't overheat or anything. We used a little bit of ablator, but not much. We had 60 to begin with. We've burned off 0.17. So probably we could have just gone in the engine first and nothing would have happened to us. The... Uh, the heat shield was probably extra. Well, that's not the tightest orbit, but it's an okay orbit. It's not going to hit Ike or anything. Now, I'm going to take SAS off again. Ooh. Looks like our aerodynamics is a little bit haphazard, isn't it? Well, that's fine. We're in the thinner part of the atmosphere. We don't need to worry too much about that, and... This way, at least, we're going to be saving electric charge. We were sort of running out there. And then once we're in space, we can re-engage SAS to stop this whole thing. Stop the mad madness, please. And make sure we're oriented so we get some sunlight. Okay. So now we're just going to go back to Apoapsis and then uh, come down around there. If you wanted to make sure to come down somewhere else, what you would do is you'd go to Apoapsis, boost the periapsis up, get into a nice stable orbit, and then wait and try and figure out exactly how to land. I'm not going to go through how to uh, hit a particular landing spot right now. It does not seem like we need a heat shield. So I'm actually going to dump that right now. Yeah, let's try and decouple the heat shield now. It should uh, go back to the surface. It's on this same trajectory right now. Seems like we could slow down. So actually the fact that I'm using the engine right now is mainly bringing down the apoapsis. You can see. But it's also bringing down the periapsis somewhat. Now it looks like we're going to crash there, right? Or land. I'm hoping that the atmospheric drag will end us up right about there. Let's see. Oh, uh, we want to do the parachutes at a different time. The drogue chutes are for higher up. 
to slow you down. And then the main shoots are, of course, lower. Have we done uh, temperature? Let's transmit that. Right now, it's not safe to deploy any of the parachutes. Now, the reason you want to use the parachutes is because you'll note that we're still going 800 meters per second, and we're pretty close to crashing, right? So actually, right now, I'm not feeling that great about my situation. And the fact that uh, Duna's atmosphere is so thin makes me think that it's not going to slow me down in time before I slam into the ground at high speed. So I'm going to use the engine. I'm going to try the parachutes now, the drogue chutes. I'm going to try the drogue chutes. Okay, there they go. Doesn't seem like they're really doing enough to slow me down. They're helping, they're helping, don't get me wrong. And they're certainly orienting the vehicle, but I'm getting real close to crashing here. But now the main chutes are available, so let's use those. Or at least, well, I, I pressed the button. Uh, I guess they're armed. We'll see if they deploy at all. Now you can tweak the pressure settings on them. Oh, there they go. So you might want to do that for different atmospheres, like Duna's atmosphere is so thin, you might want to tweak the setting. Okay, the drogue chutes are now fully deployed. Main chutes are fully deployed. Despite having so many parachutes, we're still going pretty fast. 10 meters per second is a little bit fast compared to what I would like. And that is for a fairly small probe, mind you. But you saw why I wanted the engine. It was just to slow down so we could deploy the parachutes. If you don't have the engine, then it's quite possible you'll never get to a speed where it's safe to deploy the parachutes. And then you smack into the ground at 700 meters per second. On Mars, uh, the parachutes are probably not going to be enough. Uh, you would need about 400 meters per second to slow down even after parachute deployment. Uh, you'll still be going so fast that you need the engine power just to uh, make a safe touchdown. So that's that's the thing you'll see in Mars mission planning. Okay, let's try and make this safe. Now the Terrier engine is not good in the atmosphere. Thankfully, there's not much atmosphere here on Duna. Okay, plop. A little bit of a rough landing, but not too bad. And let's observe the mystery goo. We will transmit that data, first from Duna's lowlands. And we will log temperature. Transmit that. Okay, and that's how you get to the surface of another planet. Uh, there are bound to be a lot of questions, so if you do have any questions, please do ask them in the comments section below the video. Other than that, I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments, leave those in the comment section below as well. And I'll see you next time.